Beginning of the end or the road to re-election? Democrats in the U.S. House of Representatives finally pressing the trigger on impeachment proceedings against Donald Trump, the U.S. president, quick to call it a witch hunt, promising and delivering the uh, transcripts of his uh, conversation with Ukraine's new president, the one where a whistleblower claims that Trump asked Volodymyr Zelensky eight times to probe the activities in that country of Joe Biden's son. How strong a case is asking a foreign leader to dig up dirt on your rivals a breach of the president's constitutional oath? The president has admitted to asking the president of Ukraine to take actions which would benefit him politically. The, action of the, Trump, the actions of the Trump presidency revealed the dishonorable fact of the president's betrayal of his oath of office, betrayal of our national security, and betrayal of the integrity of our elections. Therefore, it took today, a lot of soul searching and a lot of pressure from her left flank for the most powerful Democrat in Washington to launch those impeachment proceedings. The House Speaker Nancy Pelosi knows she has virtually no chance of seeing a Republican-controlled U.S. Senate convert an eventual impeachment into dismissal by a two-thirds majority. Will taking a stand help or hurt the opposition to Trump as we head into the 2020 presidential campaign on that score? What are the optics for voters torn between those aghast over politicians willing to test the laws of their own land? and those who see the rulings by parliaments or judges as obstructions of the will of the people. Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the road to impeachment. Joining us, former U.S. diplomat Jeffrey Hawkins, associate research fellow at the French think tank, uh, the international affairs think tank, IRIS. Thank you for being with us. I want to thank as well uh, Randy Yellows, member of the uh, French branch of Republicans Overseas and who lectures on digital media issues. And an attorney. And an attorney. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we're also joined uh, by Craig Capitas, contributing editor to Quartz. How are you, sir? Very well, Mon Capitan. All right. Anastasia Shapochinka is a lecturer at the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po. Welcome to the show. Thank you. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. It all started when the uh, Trump administration's acting director of national intelligence refused to allow Congress to hear about a whistleblower alert. He'll be answering those lawmakers on Thursday, but only after the whole story blew up. Let's begin with the latest, what the White House calls the, quote, full unredacted transcript of Trump's call with the Ukrainian president, but which is in fact a memo. Uh, Anka Ula has more. From the Ninth Circuit. A short phone call that could have long-lasting consequences for the U.S. president. On Wednesday, the White House released a memo roughly transcribing a July 25th conversation between Donald Trump and Ukraine's newly elected president, Vladimir Zelensky. In it, Trump pressed the leader to work with the U.S. Attorney General and his own personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, to investigate former Vice President Joe Biden and his son. There's a lot to talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution, and a lot of people want to find out about that. So whatever you can do with the attorney general would be great. Biden is campaigning against Trump in next year's presidential election. Trump has claimed with no evidence that Biden sought to interfere with the Ukrainian prosecutor's investigation of his son Hunter, who'd been hired by a gas company in the country. Zelensky offered to look into the matter. The next prosecutor general will be 100 percent my person, my candidate, who will be approved by the parliament and will start as a new prosecutor in September. He or she will look into the situation, specifically in the company that you mentioned in this issue. Trump has recently confirmed that he ordered the freezing of nearly $400 million in aid to Ukraine a few days before that call, although there's no mention of this in the memo. For Trump, the conversation proves he did not pressure Zelensky in any way. There was no pressure. The way you had that built up, that call, it was going to be the call from hell. It turned out to be a nothing call. The phone call is just one piece of an overall complaint made in mid-August by a whistleblower, which has become central to the formal impeachment inquiry launched Tuesday by Democratic House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Jeffrey Hawkins, what do you make of what the White House has released? God, there's so much to it. First of all, I think the distinction that you made is a really important one, and that is this is not a transcript. 
that call. It is a memorandum of conversation, what we in the business call a MIMCON. So it's just someone who's taking some notes while the people are talking and then goes back and types some things up. Is there a full transcript somewhere? The, the White House obviously has the capacity to make complete and, and uh, factual transcripts of this conversation. In this instance, the president clearly chose not to. And there have been problems in the past with, with the White House people professional people accused of leaking early on in the, in the Trump administration. It was, so Trump has really uh, sort of um, cracked down on all that. But the, the, the conversation, I mean, there's so many different elements to this. The conversation in itself. All right, let's start with what's inside of what was uh, released by the White House. What do you make of it? Is it like the way Donald Trump describes it as uh, not that big a deal? Uh, absolutely not. First of all, uh, uh, while it is uh, possible that a, a, a president might speak with another uh, head of state to discuss issues of corruption or maybe a real, really high-profile law enforcement matter. Um, the idea of a, of a sitting U.S. president calling a foreign head of state and asking him to investigate a U.S. person is just very, very unusual. If the president is worried about wrongdoing by an American, that's what the U.S. Department of Justice is for. Um, now, when you add into the fact that the person that he's asking this president to investigate is the son of his uh, potential uh, opponent in upcoming elections, it just you know it makes your head explode when you think about it. Randy Yellows, you agree? I honestly disagree. I think, firstly, you have to look at it, at things today. Everything has become a possible issue for impeachment purposes. You could look through the at the time at the Obama administration, the Republicans were after Obama several times or threatening to impeach him also. And every time there's been an issue going back through the different presidential periods that have been involved, we've had issues of impeachment. So every time there's an issue that creates a controversy, we find the opposition here, the Democrats, taking advantage of a situation to try to expose certain improper, what they consider allegedly misconduct on his part. Now, what happens today is I think we should know is that we have the Democratic Party in opposition, and again, they're ha having a difficulty. But, but yeah, but I'm asking what, 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 it's what Donald Trump actually says in that memo. Again, I can- uh, You understand, the question you're asking, I think you have to go back to what the definition of what impeachment is. We were just discussing about it, what is high crimes, and misdemeanors. Now, he says, he says, and I quote, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution, and a lot of people want to find out about that. So whatever you can do with the attorney general, and he's talking about his own attorney general, William Barr, would be great. He's asking the president of Ukraine to help his attorney general. I have a question for you. Do you know, uh, you're talking about impeachment. Now go back to the Constitution. Does it describe what are the different issues of impeachment? What does it say? It doesn't describe what high crimes and misdemeanors are. It is what the House of Representatives will define at one point. So today, the, the, the head of the House of Representatives decided that. And that's what President Ford at one time said, whatever party is in power at the level of the House of Representatives will decide what will be the improper conduct of a civil officer that may be impeached. So today, right. it's a political agenda to decide, well, because the Democrats are in power today, they'll decide that maybe a certain type of conduct will be an issue. Uh, Craig Capias, what, from what you saw on paper, is that grounds for impeachment? Sounded like the Macarena to me. Do the Macarena. Look, an impeachment is an indictment. It's a fancy word for an indictment. And as counsel here will tell us, you can indict a friggin' ham sandwich. When you start going down this impeachment road, the trial goes to the Senate. In American history, only two presidents have been impeached. Andrew Johnson and right, Bill Clinton. We'll, no, no. We'll, we'll go they, over this. No, no, we'll but they were part, not but, convicted. Right. But let's, okay, so but let's they can go impeach him. But, 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 but let's go over the, the, the point that was just made by Randy Yellows here, which is that he doesn't find that there are grounds for removing the president. Of course president. there are. You can impeach a ham sandwich. No, it doesn't ground, matter. Exactly. But there are not <clears throat> grounds for removing a president. No, removing a president requires a vote by the Senate, a conviction on the indictment. All right, I'll put the question that, that, differently. That's what, it's, is it's there a smoking gun in, this, in, these, in what we've read? Yeah, does a ham sandwich taste good? That's yeah. Funny. I gotta say, first of all, um, from a diplomatic perspective, this is completely uh, out of the ordinary. This is not how presidents behave. So there are issues of norms here. But when you, when you get to the impe impeachable part of this, this is very consistent with um, the president's MO. Right. Um, and it reminds the language reminds me very much of what he said to Comey 
uh, when he was talking about his first national security advisor. The former um, FBI director. Right, the former FBI. And he said, I, I hope you can see clear to doing something about this. And then, uh, you know, when, when President Trump's personal attorney testified before Congress about how he acted, he said, that's how the, that's how the president passes his messages. And, and uh, I don't think you have to have uh, 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 a smoking gun, nor do I think the president needs to be a ham sandwich, um, for this to constitute a, a reasonable grounds for impeachment. If, if, if uh, the members of Congress don't feel it is, there are plenty of other issues that could be brought up as well. Um, what's important, though, is, as, as our colleagues have pointed out, is this is a political process also. So whether or not uh, that meets uh, the grounds for impeachment for Democrats, it may not for Republicans. Well, that's it. It's that's, not, yeah. It is not statutory. It is not statutory. It's completely political. And the question is, we should look at, at Andrew Jackson at the time. Why was he found Andrew impeached? Johnson. Johnson. I keep on mixing the two. That's You're okay. right. But Johnson, at the point, was said he was impeached at the time because he had improper language regarding but Congress I, 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 at the time. I, but we, we, no, but to take you to what Let's not go back to the 19th century. Let's go back no, to what happened what's two hours today ago. is improper conduct can okay. be whatever you Can want. we go back to what happened a couple of hours ago? I mean, I hate to keep agreeing with a Republican, but I have to, because what you're saying about Johnson and Clinton is correct, and it's, and it's absolutely germane to this discussion. Both men were not convicted. The only American president who came close to conviction was Richard Nixon. And he resigned we're, before the articles of impeachment. Listen, we're before talking the across, articles of we're talking impeachment could be, here, could be written up. I'm presented. asking you. The point is, why did Nixon quit? Because there was tape. They had his voice on tape admitting the crimes. This transcript, whatever you call it, is a ham sandwich. The America, this United States Senate will not convict a United States president and throw him out of office unless there's tape. That was the bar that was set during the uh, Nixon administration when Nixon resigned, and it's remained that way. Right. So show me the tape. I'm not sure about that. The other issue, of course, is that uh, the, in, the whistleblower, apparently, and this is all coming through the, the press, the whistleblower has said that this is not the only instance uh, where improper pressure was put on, on the Ukrainians uh, to, to investigate uh, Let, let's talk about former Vice, Vice President Biden. So there may be more to this story than, than just what we're seeing in a, a White House release transcript. Again, let's just talk about this conversation. Anastasia Shapochenko, uh, what we noticed reading it is perhaps this is standard fare when you have a country that's dependent on U.S. military aid, U.S. Uh, uh, development aid, uh, that has uh, Russia as its neighbor. The language of Ukraine's new president in what we've read is, shall we say, obsequious? Uh, <laughs> I stayed in your hotel. <laughs> he, he, what did you... What did, tower. Yeah, yeah what, right. But is that just normal... St Standard fare? <laughs> I think that uh, definitely the president of Ukraine wasn't aware that, that this was, he wasn't counting of the fact that this was going to come up as, and, and blow it up into his face. Um, what more was your reaction even, to it? Uh, so far, there is no official statement. No, your reaction. And my reaction, yes. Uh -huh. uh, my reaction is that, of course, this shows you what a small and weak country is and what its foreign policy um, and what its, 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 its conduct is, which is totally normal. Of course, as you mentioned, Ukraine is relying on the U.S., in the current situation of the military conflict with Russia in the east, uh, of uh, the especially when we're looking, you know, the Zelensky new president coming up entirely political novice, you know, he is relying on the U.S. today. When Europe and especially after the recent meeting between Macron and Putin, when Europe is pretty much ready for lifting the sanctions, Macron stated he's ready for uh, constructing a new security architecture with Russia in Europe, and uh, in this situation. Situation, the U.S. being far more removed from Russia uh, trade-wise, and uh, Trump being Trump, and his view on Vladimir Putin being his view, the U.S. Uh, foreign policy didn't uh, pivot significantly toward Russia during his term. And the reliance on the U.S. for political support today is extraordinarily important for Ukraine. So, of course, a call of Trump to Ukrainian president is an event which shouldn't be underestimated. Support of, U of the U.S. president is extraordinarily important for Zelensky uh, in his dialogues with Putin. And support of Europeans as, of course, the worst and more significant for Ukraine, part of the call 
con confirms, it is not sufficient. And as we know it for ourselves, and as Zelensky said, unfortunately for himself, in this call, which became public, it shows, of course, the relationship between the great power and a small power. And, and when he said uh, the next prosecutor general will be 100 percent my person, he or she will look into the situation specifically to the company that you mentioned in this issue. He was talking, I think, about uh, this company that... Burisma, uh, yes. Uh, it's a company which is the biggest um, gas producing, uh, initial gas producing company in Ukraine. And uh, it's been owned uh, by, at the time when uh, Hunter Biden was hired to the board of directors by um, Zlochevsky, who was at the moment, uh, who was before, sorry, between 2010 and 2012, Minister of Ecology of Ukraine. Uh, since then, uh, in 2013, Zlochevsky uh, claimed that he had sold the company and uh, nobody knows the actual owners, which are claimed to be either of the two big oligarchs of Ukraine. One is Kolomoisky, one is Pinchuk. Aha! Both of the, who's a very interesting character, right? And who is and who's, the, whose attorney is Zelensky's, Zelensky's chief of staff. Yes, right? Kolomoisky and, and is one of you, the big, well, I'm big curious, oligarchs. Do you think yeah, that Trump and Zelensky get on because both of them are failed television stars? <laughs> I mean, is there is there something cooking there? They certain that they're talk the same language. They both had TV programs. I think that Trump, um, for Trump, um, I, I don't see. I, I have, I have diff the diplomat will, will probably will probably enlighten us more on, on the on the executive vision of of Ukraine from the U.S. But in my opinion, Trump is more likely to see himself on par or at least uh, closer to Vladimir Putin as as a leader than I don't think that he envisions himself just as Vladimir Putin does mm. it as equal to a, a, a Ukrainian president, be it Zelensky or any other person. Mm. So, in light of the way this company is described, sh should Hunter Biden? Biden have taken this job when his dad was vice president? I, I, I mean, who knows? Uh, I, why not? Is you it know? an ethical I mean, breach? I, I don't think so. I mean, a, 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 the, the children and spouses of, of senior officials are entitled to have uh, um, uh, employment. However, what, what would be an ethical breach is if the president didn't, or the vice president did in fact intervene with Ukrainian authorities to protect his son. Now, that would be a clear conflict of interest. My understanding is that no one in the, in the Trump administration has demonstrated in any way, with any kind of evidence, that that in fact took place. And in fact, uh, Vice President Biden's position on the call, you know, firing this prosecutor, was one that had been agreed to in common with our European allies and was not something that he was pursuing personally. And the IMF and the World Bank, and we and should add. IMF and the World Bank. The IMF and the World Bank. And Joe Biden says that uh, he never discussed uh, business matters with uh, Bo Biden regarding Ukraine. It is very possible. The same way you're trying to accuse Mr. Trump, doesn't Mr. Biden also should benefit from the presumption of innocence regarding this until further investigation are done? Today, we're whistleblowing. It's a whole total political scenario which we're establishing today. We're in the beginning. We're here discussing these things. Let the investigations occur. Let evidence be presented. Let there be some testimonies. And let's see what's happening because maybe there are issues. If there are Grounds, there'll be grounds. If there are no grounds, then there'll be no grounds. And I think the fact that one requesting investigations on the one side is also maybe a legitimate fact that happens yeah. on, we're, on we're that gonna, basis. We're, we're going to pick up on that point when we come back. We're going to take a very quick break. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. You're watching the France 24 debate. We're uh, with uh, you, former U.S. diplomat uh, Jerry, Jeffrey Hawkins, who's with the uh, think tank Iris. We're with R Randy Yellows, member of the France branch of Republicans overseas. Craig Capit is contributing editor to Quartz and Anastasia Shapkochinka, lecturer at the French Political Science Institute, uh, Sciences Po. Uh, we've been uh, talking about the crisis of institutions in the U.S. We've seen just now, gotten a flavor of the crisis of institutions in the UK. And by the way, Tuesday, it wasn't Donald Trump, but Boris Johnson in the hot seat uh, with that landmark ruling. And it was all happening while Johnson was in Trump's company at the United Nations in New York. Uh, Boris, the first uh, couple of months we had been, I think we were 0 for 7 with the Supreme Court. And since then, we won the wall, we won asylum, we won some of the biggest ones. We've had a great streak going. Uh, I'm sure that's going to happen to you. Well, well, I, well we're not counting our chickens, and we're, we're full of respect, as I say, for the, the justices of our, <laughs> our Supreme Court. But uh, we're going we're gonna to push on. With, we're going to respect what the court had to say, but we're going to get on and, and deliver Brexit. Uh, he's full of respect, but we just heard in those remarks 
uh, Boris Johnson with pointed digs at the judges. Again, it's this chipping away at these institutions, the parliament, the judiciary, and in Donald Trump's case, uh, the fourth estate, the media. Well, yeah, well, Boris, Boris Johnson is, is, does it with more panache. He's a Gilbert and Sullivan character where... Where with Trump, he's... he's but this, this goes beyond just the U.S. and the U.K. right now. It's everywhere. Well, it's in Ukraine. It's in Russia. It's in Turkey. Name a country, and you see the defenestration of liberal, democratic, you know, Western thought. People like strongmen. Uh, it seems. Why is that? You know, there seem to be a lot of reasons. But what's happening, what Trump and Johnson and Erdogan and Zelensky and Putin and Maduro and a lot of other people have engendered is this kind of destructive sectarianism that we're seeing around the world right now, of which I, Trump is If I may disagree, <laughs> so we can get back to the debate mode here. <laughs> uh, maybe too much agreement so far. And uh, just, I, I would disagree about Zelensky, and I would not put him in the same. You uh, like him. Uh, it's not about me liking him. Here we are not to debate the personal likes or dislikes, but rather uh, the objective. Um, but didn't he run a, pe the a people versus system. the, you know, he, he shows up not being a member of a political party, uh, he the idea of well, I'm an outsider, I'm going to blow up the system. Just the same way as Macron was uh, when he came to, to 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 run to run for p p president, he constituted his party after he won the presidential elections in the same way and using the same exact um, methods. Yeah, Zelensky constituted his party, which won the majority in parliament only three months after it was constituted. Zelensky today is one of the most legitimately elected presidents in the world because he uh, his the elections in Ukraine were observed by thousands of uh, OEC observers and by thousands of observers inside Ukraine. Political society of Ukraine is one of the most mature societies. Zelensky won with 72% of the popular vote, having never participated in politics and having announced his um, candidature only several months before elections. But when we, we look ahead now to the prospect of this impeachment process, which is going to collide with... Uh, a U.S. presidential election campaign. You'll have those on the right who watch their news channels and watch their Twitter feeds, those on the left who watch their news channels and their Twitter feeds, and ne'er the two shall meet. Right. Um, and, uh, and obviously we've all been thinking a lot about this, and, and uh, I think you Because impeachment... You, you mentioned earlier there's, there's essentially zero chance that the Senate's going to go along with the House. You need two-thirds of senators... And uh, there's some debate about whether politically it makes sense, and that's why uh, Speaker of the House Pelosi had, had prevaricated for so long on, on impeachment. But there's, there's a higher issue at stake here. And, and I take a little bit issue uh, with some of the comments earlier of our colleague in, in that, um, yeah, there's a lot of politics to this, and, and impeachment is political, but there's also what's, what's right. Um, and uh, I think that it's important that if, if members of the House of Representatives believe mm -hmm. that impeachable offense has been committed, that they bring articles of impeachment. I don't like, as a voter, as an American, the fact that this is going to be strictly along partisan lines. As a registered Democrat, um, and you may disagree, and we, we can respectfully disagree on that, I think the problem there is not that the, the Democrats are doing some witch hunt against a president who's completely blameless. The problem is that the president has such a, a tight rain on, on, on the Republican Party, and so many Republican mar moderates are leaving Congress that the only people left are the ones that will, will refuse to vote for impeachment even when presented with evidence of, of, of you know, high crimes and misdemeanors. Uh, and, and that's where we are, but I think it's important but it, that this step be but it's, taken. But it's more than that. We saw, we saw Boris Johnson a few minutes ago relishing the drama in the House of Commons, yeah. saying, bring it on, and taunting uh, Jeremy Corbyn. And we've heard Donald Trump the last few days saying, bring on impeachment. Is getting impeached part of his re-election strategy, Randy Yeltsin? I think the, the, the question of the impeachment is not a question of who brought it on. I think you have to turn the question the opposite way. It was a choice by the Democrats to do so. And strategically, I think it's a wrong, it's an error that they've made in their campaign to help Biden because it shows that they are weak. Rather than trying to fight Trump on the issues, Trump has, is popular at the polls, economically strong. He's seen as a strong leader uh, internationally. So rather than fighting him, they've gone down the path of impeachment, saying so we're wait, trying to So you're saying him. impeachment makes it easier for him to get reelected? I think the impeachment shows that the Democratic Party is weak but does, today. Does but does impeachment make it? I'm not giving you the side of, uh, You have to look and say, today, uh, they've done it to themselves. 
they've decided that the choice, the Democratic Party has decided that they're going to impeach Trump. But does, so does decide, impeachment make it easier for Donald Trump to get reelected? Impeachment, I think, brings the issue. The question is, is that what's left on the table? Is that they're coming to these specific issues? I think the Trump, I think that the <coughs> Americans are going to have to make a choice. I think you're asking us to, to decide today what's going to be decided. Today, they're going to start investigations. They're going to be sending out subpoenas, et cetera, et cetera. Today, we're in the beginning stages. Today, we're deciding what will help him. But again, how is it seen by the American people? We need a strong president. The Americans want a strong president. Today, we have issues regarding geopolitical situations that are very difficult to manage. I, 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 don't, I don't agree with that. I think what America today wants is a television show. And Donald Trump provides it. In a democracy, it. you get what you deserve, and you deserve what correct. you get. And that's what's going on in America and a in lot the in, in, around the world right now. You know, Francois and I were talking early today. I mean, why has this happened? Well, back, back in my day, he said, turning up his hearing aid, you could get anywhere from 400,000 to 1.5 million people on the street to protest the Vietnam War. You know, you can't get people on the street anymore. That kind of, that kind of group on the street. Back in 1967, Norman Mailer took 35,000 people to the Pentagon and said they were going to levitate at 100 feet. The United States government said no. You can only levitate at 10 feet. So they <laughs> signed an agreement with the U.S. government. Miller wrote a, a Pulitzer Prize winning nonfiction book about this called Armies of the Night. You could look it up. The point I'm trying to make here is Americans now want to be entertained, and Donald Trump is entertaining them. Donald Trump is also mobilizing them, however. Uh, and we've seen lots of demonstrations, whether it's the Me Too movement, the environmental stuff we saw this week. Um, the, the reaction to Donald Trump is bringing people out of the street and, and bringing a kind of engagement, How many? political engagement. How many? Um, on his own side, the, you know, you look at these, these uh, rallies that he has. He's, he's ge definitely generating a lot of energy amongst his own supporters, but he's also generating Those a tremendous organized. amount back, of energy. Those are organized. Back in the day uh, of major rallies that overthrew Nixon, stopped the Vietnam War, you could get, you, you know, I can remember, for instance, in, 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 19, in 1969 at the Atlantic City Pop Festival, which was two weeks before Woodstock, which no one had ever heard of, Grace Slick of the Jefferson Airplane right. got up on stage and she said, how many people are going to Woodstock? Everyone said, what's Woodstock? Overnight, 250,000 more people showed up. Where are the protesters? But, right, the, 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 can I just talk about the politics for a minute? You're not the politics, yeah. yeah. Um, so... Uh, I, I think any any person here would be an absolute fool to, to bet on what the outcome of this election right. is. So I'm not sitting here saying the Democrats have it locked up. But I would not say that they're coming from a position of weakness. Um, you know, polling data, and we're way out, so polling data doesn't really mean that much. But Biden's up 10 points over Trump. This is not, the, you know, this is not a Democratic Party worried about, about defeat. We look at the 2018 election and the, and the Democrats did extremely well. Um, and there are there's something, I don't know what the number is exactly, but something like 20 moderate Republican members of the House that aren't even running again for lots of reasons, but among which they don't see an environment that's favorable to them in this Trump area. We so, so it's not necessarily as necessarily as dangerous as, as, as you might think. We, we It'll just have to depend on how it... We knew out. already going into 2020 that it's that the, the campaign is going to be basically a referendum on Trump, uh, in the in the way that in the UK, right. the, the next yeah. snap general Absolutely. election will be a referendum yeah. on Brexit. That's how they're fighting him. Yeah. The impeachment is attacking Trump. With with impeachment, does it That's change the, the campaign's tone at all? Of course it does. And and I think there's no how? doubt that that uh, impeachment hearings. Uh, the president will try and use that and mobilize his base. We're being attacked. The lamestream media is trying to blame me for things that I haven't done, and I'm just being a good president. Um, but I, the question is, and it's the, a question that Nancy Pelosi has answered in the affirmative, have we crossed some barrier here? Are we beyond that? Have we gotten to actions that, that, that are so out of keeping with our democratic norms that even moderate Republicans or, or Republican, uh, college-educated Republican women in the suburbs might look at this and say, you know what, this really isn't how I expect the president. R Randy Ellis, do you worry about U.S. democracy? No. Honestly, today, no. I believe the democracy today is, reflects upon how the, our world is today with the digital world that we live in. People are looking for it. Direct action. We used to have the TV. Today, you want to know exactly everybody communicates via social media, and this is what you can expect. And it's and a good thing. 
it's a it's what exists it's a question of not saying can't say if it's good or bad it's what it is today and that's what the democracy is today and we have to live that's in right. this type of it's democracy an echo, it's an, it, back in the day when you wanted to change a system you had to physically be there nowadays all you have to do is do a tweet and you be there in the ether on the internet you know how many it, that's that's where it is how many followers do you get how many re, retweets that is the difference. Being there today is different. It's digital. It's in the ether. And I think it's not very good. But what do I know? All right. I, 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 unfortunately, we're out of time. That's, uh, but we'll, we'll have to leave it there for now. But we will continue this discussion on the road to 2020 and impeachment, perhaps. Randy Yellows, I want to thank you. I want to thank Craig Kapitas, Jeffrey Hawkins. I also want to thank Anastasia Shapochinka. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.